times. I've seen different versions of how many times you've won Sports Writer of the, of the Year, but let's just call it a lot. Uh, he's been uh, uh, very well known by all of his colleagues. One of probably the most uh, noted and famous uh, sports writers in the United States. But beyond that, he's also a writer of books. And uh, among the books that he has written, is my favorite book is a very small book on the history of baseball that is absolutely superb that came out several years ago, I think 2006, uh, something like that. Uh, he just came out with a new book. Uh, if you're a baseball fan, you'll know it. If you're not a baseball fan, uh, you may never read it, but a book about one of the icons of baseball in the 1940s, 1950s, early 60s about Stan Musial, uh, one of the top 25 players of all time. Uh, wonderful biography. But beyond that, he's also written books uh, about entertainers and other sports uh, other than, than baseball. The most noted, he wrote a book that you probably have seen, the movie, or maybe on reruns on TV, uh, Paul Miner's Daughter, a uh, biography of Loretta Lynn uh, that became a movie. Um, George wrote that. He's written the biography of Barbara Mandel, Mandrell, and also um, uh, helped Martina Navratilova uh, to write her autobiography. There's a whole host of other books, but I won't go through them. I think you get the idea. Well, tonight we're honored to have George with us. So welcome, George, and we'll have a conversation. OK, I have to read one thing that I found. I was trying to find a good way to summarize what people think of your writing. So you'll probably recognize this, but I'm going to give the intro. This is a little blurb that I took off the internet, uh, and it was written by a, a woman in New York. Here's what she had to say. I hate to say it, but the sports pages, I generally don't read them. I like to watch sports, but often the columns talk about sports in a way that makes it hard for me to understand. I often don't know who they are talking about, or I don't know enough about sports so that a writer's discussion of the minutia of the game will be completely over my head. Hence, this is the reason why I stay away from reading the sports pages. She then says, the writing of George Vesey is something different. I'm not sure exactly when I began reading Vesey's columns, but I remember the first time thinking what I had just read was a fluke. Then I began to look for his columns because I enjoyed them so much. It's me, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> I did not have to know all the ins and outs of the game to understand his columns. In fact, I did not have to know anything about sports at all. The subject of sports for George Vesey seems to be simply a vehicle for him to tell a greater story. The story of people and human interaction. The story of people and human interaction. The playing of sports provides a superb stage for the examination of the human spirit. What a great... Who was that? You never, you didn't know what that was? No. You did a, a little spiel one day in uh, the library, the Mid-Manhattan Library, uh, back in 2009. And a woman by the name of Cynthia Chaldakis was the librarian at that library, oh, okay. and she posted this. Oh, okay. That, that. It does come back. I mean, I had a nice visit there. All right, that's, that's very nice. Um, I thought, you know, only my mom could have been sending that from, from the beyond. Uh, but, then, but then again, then again, she was always my, my most severe critic, always wondering when I was going to get out of sports and, and do something important. And then she said the same thing about my, uh, my middle brother, Peter, who's a basketball expert uh, with the New York Post and on television. But then finally, uh, the third boy, the, the youngest, he has a doctorate and uh, teaches at Colgate University in upstate New York, and she would refer to him as the educated one. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sure it sounds like a lot of other families we, we could mention where you know, it's hard to do right. But anyway, but it's nice to know I have. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a great testimonial to the pieces that you write, I think. And, and uh, 
I can see where she would come up with that, having read your columns for 8,000 years. And then it's, it's very nice of her to write. I, I will say this, and I, I write, I, as long as I've been writing the column, or I, as I evolved from starting to write a sports column, I came at it as a, a news reporter. I had been a news reporter for 10 years, and it was very hard for me to develop a voice uh, as a columnist. I had never thought about being a columnist. Going back to sports was somewhat of a surprise. I got talked back into it. We had the first female sports editor in the United States, um, and she wasn't she didn't come from a sports background. I mean, Leanne Schreiber, and she talked me into coming back um, and to, to write about sports as theater, as short stories, and write about it as literature. Have fun doing it. Do some long pieces. Uh, drop in on places, and then we'll both move on and do other things. And it seemed like a cool gig for a couple of years. She left almost right away. She went out to Baja, California on uh, uh, vacation, slept under the stars, and psychologically never really came back to that job. <laughs> so leaving me behind to, to fend my way. A couple of years later, I wound up being a uh, sports columnist, and it was very hard because I was still writing as a news reporter who had learned that, that the personality of the writer, and this was the, the 1980 to 82, it's, it was a different world. I mean, it was pre-internet, and the cult of the personality had not yet seeped or, or poured into even the, the stale New York Times. So I, I had a sports editor named Joe Becky Young who had to tell me, you can use the first person. Red Smith didn't use the first person. He used arch ways of referring to himself, like a fly on the wall would have seen. And he said, be more direct. And it was really good advice, very literate advice, because while it's not always a matter of I, it did allow me to put myself into the column and the things that I saw. The other thing that I evolved, which deals back to the, the, this lady writing that, is that because I had written for other parts of the paper, I had a good sense of who the New York Times audience was. Again, pre-internet, before there was a, a worldwide audience of hardcore sports fans looking up what we did on the, on, the, uh, on the web, it was important for me to try and reach the people that I knew were getting their hands on the paper. And I didn't want to lose half the readership of the New York Times. I didn't want to be writing for what I perceived as the, the mostly male sports fans who, who got into the paper. I was writing for the retired um, uh, teacher who was living on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and every day she went out for coffee in Danish at uh, you know the, the, the Seinfeld uh, Cafe or you know whatever, whatever it was, and. She would read the New York Times. I didn't want her, if she even got near the sports section, I didn't want her to pass it by. I wanted to be writing for a general audience. I wanted to write for, and, and if I can say this, and I hope it doesn't sound snobbish, but I was writing for a fairly literate, fairly educated readership that I, I know we have from having been at the Times already for more than a decade. So I began to write thinking of a female reader and what she would take from the things I, I wrote. And it served me, I think, personally extremely well, because it meant that every column, everything I wrote, I had to open it up. I had to explain. I had to human, humanize it. I had to personalize it. I, what, I, I didn't want to write, uh, why are the Yankees on a five-game losing streak? Um, why can't the Knicks make better draft choices? I didn't have to. Nobody was putting pressure on me. We have a broader audience than that. So I was writing for somebody else. It, it served me well, and I finish up the thought, because when the, when the web came along, and, and to, my, to my shock, I mean, when we're talking about business and sports, having this web available to you first as a tool, I thought it was a cool tool to have. Uh, and then somebody said, no, no, it's the other way around. We're trying to expand our presence on the web. We're trying to reach people. And the things that I care about, like the Tour de France, uh, the World Cup of Soccer, uh, female sports, a lot of things, I discovered that there was this huge audience. If I would write a, a column about a U.S.-Brazil soccer game, the paper in Sao Paulo would pick it up, and I would start getting letters, most of them in reasonably good English, from Brazil, uh, saying nice things about me and nice things about American football, because they weren't threatened by it by any means. And it, and it was really a sweet contact out all over the world. So that's, that's a major change. And it allowed me to continue to reach out to the, the broadest possible audience, not just an American audience. So I see myself as writing for, essentially, people all over the world. And, and you know, 
the example you see back there. Well, it's, it's funny that you went right to, you wanted this broad audience, and that's what you're looking to do. Is that what led you to do the books with Martina Navratilova, with maybe the books about Barbara Mandrell, and maybe uh, <coughs> and, um, about Loretta Lynn? Were you looking for something different than just male-dominated sports? Well, I don't know that I was looking for it. I mean, each, every story is a story in itself. And, and whether I was covering it as a news thing or a book, things just uh, things things just sort of dropped in my lap. And I was a news reporter in Appalachia. I got to know Loretta Lynn uh, because of my curiosity about hearing about this country singer. I covered a coal mine disaster uh, where 38 miners were killed on, on New Year's Eve in 1970. Um, and I got very involved in that story, you know, found out why it happened, and I got to know some of the widows and family members. And Loretta Lynn came in off the road and did a concert for a benefit for the family members. And I thought that was pretty cool, and I wanted, that made me even more interested in meeting her. Finally did about a year later, interviewed her when she won a big award. And out of that came a friendship. I wound up doing her book, kind of circuitously, but I, I wound up doing it. And later it was made into a movie. I had nothing to do with the movie, I can, I can assure you. But no, it was, it, was, it was subject matter. I loved covering Appalachia so much. It's still the best job I ever had. I mean, writing a sports column for the last 27 years has been wonderful. But the two years that I spent covering Appalachia, living down there where um, Louisville is not in Appalachia, it's kind of in the flatlands, but I was only an hour or two from uh, the mountain parkway leading up into eastern Kentucky and West Virginia. And that's where my head, as my wife says, she lived in Louisville and I lived in Hazard, Kentucky. And, and it's about right because that's where, if you're a reporter, you are driven to where you want to be. And, you know, I'd get a phone call and something had happened, some, somebody blew up a mine or, you know, something was going on. And I'd be heading, heading east on I-64 up where you start to see the mountains up ahead. And that's still the, the best job I ever had. You said to me that you don't consider yourself a journalist. You distance <coughs> yourself from that, that you're a writer. What, what's well, that about? I, I, I'd say this. I'm, I'm a fringe journalist, and I never took the kind of course that you're taking. I, I never took a journalism course in college. I don't know the rules, and I was only a very average reporter. So one of the reasons why I shy away, I've never taught a course, don't particularly want to, because I don't feel qualified. I've always sort of, uh, one, of my, one of my bosses is in the room, former bosses is in the room, and people will attest. I mean, I, I kind of go, I've always gone my own way on things without necessarily being particularly good at the, what I think of the hard for <coughs> tools of reporting, you know, even as far as breaking down uh, information, how to get it, and, and now with the whole world of, uh, of information available on the web and electronics. So I don't consider myself particularly you know, among the, the Times cadre of good reporters, if that's the definition of a journalist, I'm more interested in the story and writing it and where it comes out. It's in the New York Times, that's cool. The books are great too, they really are. Just about as much of my life as, as what I do for the paper because it gave me a chance to write about people. You asked if I was looking to write about something different or interesting. I have a very uh, I have a very strong mom, I have a very strong wife, uh, I have three very strong-minded kids, the first two are, are girls, and I was raving about them today, they're no longer girls, they're, they're middle-aged, and I was raving about them today in another class, the influence that, that they've been on me, all three of them, as journalists. So no, I, I was just looking for, uh, for subject matter, and if you can't get subject matter out of a coal miner's daughter or, you know, Martina Navratilova, a uh, uh, defector from communist Czechoslovakia coming to the United States and becoming this great and, and just lovely person that you know, I'm still pretty close to. And so I, I did. A book, I also did a book with a male, uh, Bob Welch, who was a pitcher for the Dodgers. Um, not so much because he was a star pitcher and won the Cy Young Award, but because he uh, realized he had to admit when he was about 23 that he was a, a raging alcoholic having blackouts at 23 and basically got into AA and went to treatment center. I went to a treatment center uh, that he had gone to. I spent a week there to understand what he'd gone through. Uh, not particularly my problem, but it was still one of the best things I ever did. So the subject matter of going to a treatment center for a week and, and always having that shape my life for the last 30 years, um, pretty much. So I, every book was different. Every book was an experience 
and you know the sports was almost incidental to, to Bob Welch. He could have been a you know a teacher or a, you know worker in a factory. The point was he had to learn to save his life. Have you talked to him in the last uh, few weeks with um, Justin Verlander on the verge of becoming the first 25 game winner? I think since Bob Welch. Maybe no, I have not talked to Bob in recent weeks. We've not been in touch for a little bit, but um, I. I I just got a cell phone recently. I got a call. There you go. It's a good column for uh, Justin Verlander. It's his 25, 25th win. Mm -hmm. So now I should. You mentioned your former boss who uh, was here. I should uh, introduce to you, and I'm going to ask her to come down shortly, not right away. Kathleen McElroy. <laughs> Kathleen, would you stand up, up in the corner? This is Kathleen McElroy, everyone. Um, former, uh, I guess, on leave from the New York Times. Um, oh. And, and now, well, okay, and now a doctoral student here at the University of Texas. How about that? Welcome, Kathleen. If you're not getting off scot-free, we're going to bring you down a little bit to share a few comments and thoughts. Uh, so we're going to make you work uh, here tonight. You're a lifelong, other than that little trip to uh, Kentucky, I think, uh, a lifelong New Yorker. How does that influence how you write and report on this world of sports that, that, that literally is all over the world now, including soccer, as you mentioned, a, a, a worldwide phenomenon? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I'm a, I'm a very chauvinistic New Yorker. I was born there. I'm a subway kid. I grew up in Queens, uh, in a part of New York City. Um, on the other hand, when I was a kid, we lived in upstate New York, and I was around uh, in, in country settings. Uh, I've also lived in, in, in Florida and in different places. I don't consider myself totally a New Yorker. I've lived overseas here and there. But deep down, you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm a, a, hard, a hardcore New Yorker, very proud of it, don't want, really openly want to live anywhere else. How does it affect what I write about sports? Well, first of all, I, I don't root for New York teams. Uh, there's one that I like. A little bit. I won't tell you which one. It's not the Yankees. I could. I could tell you that because they they did terrible things to my Brooklyn Dodgers when I was a kid. I suffered terribly at the hands of the Yankees. So while I can, I, I respect this era of the Yankees a lot. Uh, being around Jeter and Rivera and Bernie Williams and people like that, uh, I'm not emphatically not a Yankee fan. But it it gives you. I mean, being a New Yorker, you tend to have a view that if you're part of the world, the world is out there, you're close to a lot of things. You're close to Europe, you're, you're close to the United States of America, you're sort of in between somewhere, and, and, and you can go both ways. You know, lots of things come through New York when we have so many different nationalities right, right up close in front. So I, I, some things seem a little foreign to me, like I know when, when I lived in Florida for a while and I realized I knew but viscerally to realize how big college football was, where you'd see the college football uh, schools on the uh, uh, license plates. You know, they'd have uh, uh, Miami license plates or Florida State, and people would be wearing t-shirts saying, friends don't let friends, you know, marry somebody from Miami, or whatever it was, you know. And, I, and I'm sure you all have the same things in, in, in Texas with Oklahoma or some of the, the schools within the, in the state. You think? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> been been peddled a little bit. But, College football was, was not that I didn't know it existed, but to experience is something else. And to live in a state like Florida for a while, having a place down there for a while, it was a big deal. But even if you travel, I, I certainly had the sense that all the, the other kinds of sports, other ways of expressing it were important. Um, you know, when, when you get on a plane, you go somewhere and you spend a little bit of time, you, you understand. What's your, I know that you've written number of columns and there's a lot of people out there who think that you have a very soft spot for soccer um, and would write about it more if, if you had the chance. Um, the business of soccer is not as big a deal here as it is overseas. What's your favorite sport to write about? I would say two sports are my favorite. Uh, baseball because they play every day and because I grew up with it. I was a big baseball fan when I was a kid. My dad took me to Ebbets Field when I was six or seven years old, I can remember being, he actually took me to the press spot. So I've grown up in newspapers, but also around baseball. 
And they play every day, and you have access to the players. They're available in the clubhouse after the game. I grew up reading a terrific reporter for the New York Daily News named Dick Young, who was the first real baseball reporter to go into locker rooms after a game. Uh, I told the story yesterday in a class, but Young came back from the war, was assigned to the Brooklyn Dodgers, and this was the year before they, they signed Jackie Robinson. But they were still an up-and-coming team and lots of energy there. And Young would go in the clubhouse, and he would, you know, dig up stories and dig up gossip and controversy, you know, pit the manager against the players and all of that stuff. After a while, the editors of other papers in New York would tell that the baseball writers would write their story as fast as they could so they could go back into the press room, drink a lot of free beer, play cards, and they were pretty lazy guys. They wrote about the game like it was the, uh, you know, the, the War of 1812. You know, there was military maneuvers or something. There was purple pros about a baseball game. But Young was in there understanding that there were other things going on. Pitchers were complaining about being overworked. Uh, hitters were complaining they were in the wrong place in the lineup. You know, the, the usual athlete stuff. But Young was coming up with these stories and he was beating everybody else in New York. The sports editors in New York told Young, to, told their reporters, Follow that SOB wherever he goes after the game, and whoever he talks to and listen in. Now, Young was pretty defensive and wouldn't let people goof in on what he was doing particularly, but he set a tone that I grew up reading of, of a new breed of sports writers in the 40s, and of course, baseball was changing all the time, sports were changing, but in, in New York, which had so many newspapers, had seven papers when I was a kid, plus a couple of Long Island and a couple of New Jersey. So when you have you know, a dozen papers working in the, in the area, there's a lot of competition. So I grew up with that. Baseball was a great sport to, to cover. The reason I love soccer is, one, I think it's a beautiful game. I, I, I played it terribly in high school. I was, I was voted the worst defensive back ever to play for Jamaica High School in Queens. Um, but despite that, I, 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 I continue to follow it. I think it's such a beautiful game to watch. I don't claim to understand it. You become very humble in watching, in watching football, soccer, in knowing that I'll never understand it as well as people who grew up with the sport. If I'm at a World Cup or um, watching with friends, I watch with a, a friend of mine who's an Arsenal fan, fan, and he grew up in the Arsenal neighborhood of London, and another guy um, who's a Chelsea fan, and, uh, and he grew up in South Africa and then moved to, uh, to England, and watch being in the same room, not only the, 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 the stuff that they lob back and forth at each other, the droll, nasty, verbal abuse that only two Brits could do going at each other about their, about their teams, but the way that they know the game. And I'll never understand soccer. I won't understand why subtle things that are happening. I'm only beginning to get a little bit of a picture. But there's a sense of learning. And it's the same sense of learning that got me interested in. Uh, my, my pal Lance, uh, who I understand lives around here somewhere, uh, but following the Tour de France for a number of years uh, during, his, during his time, and, and other sports. You know, I want to keep learning, and, and even you know, American football, that, that other little sport that we have here in this country, you know, I, I try and learn from it, but I'll never know as much about that sport as I do about baseball. We have a few soccer players here sure. on the Texas team sitting up here. So uh, maybe uh, you can pick up some pointers before uh, before you leave. I, I am sure. I'm sure. You know, I'll explain the offside rules. Do that afterwards. No one can explain the offside. All right. You mentioned Dick Young. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the people in this room wouldn't necessarily know Dick Young because that goes back to the 50s and 60s. Right. He had a. I'm, I'm going to address the audience first, and then you. Dick Young had, and, and I was a kid then, and I used to pick up the Daily News and read Dick Young. Mm -hmm. Dick Young sold newspapers. Mm -hmm. I think people bought the newspaper to read Dick Young's column. I'm not sure that I see that anymore. It was a different business <coughs> then. But Dick Young was also a part of a group of reporters, maybe he was a little older, you were one of the newer breeds back then, that I want to talk about as well, the chipmunks. He was not a chipmunk. He was not a chipmunk. He was the he, old breed. He was, he was, he was a 40s guy. Right. And, and you want to do the intro? Or yeah. the no, 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 you right. go. Right. Right. So early in the 60s, a bunch of us who were in our, let's say in our early 20s, mid 20s, were coming along, and a few older people too who were young at heart, kind of characters, um, guy of the newsday named Stan Isaacs was one of my mentors. And we talked a lot during the games 
Um, we, we didn't so much get caught up in the winning and losing, the, the, the details of why teams are winning and losing, but the, the sociology, the personality of the players, uh, race, money, um, where people were from, attitudes. We were writing more for it as business and sociology and so on. And the older reporters were, were, were more you know, hardcore for the fan, why things, are, why the team is going good or not going good. We hung out together, we talked a lot. One of us uh, had fairly prominent front teeth. And Jimmy Cannon, this acerbic old, uh, great columnist, who was really one of my role, I love Jimmy Cannon, but he listened to us one day and said, listen to you guys, you're all like a bunch of chipmunks. And uh, that's the name stuck. So it was a badge of honor for us to be called a chipmunk. It was a badge of honor, and we still love it to that day. You know, we're as old as can be, you know, and, and some of us have, have, have passed. But it's still something that we're very proud to be part of. You know, anybody who's part of a movement, I mean, the, the, the French artists of the 19th century, the, the, um, you know, who were called the beasts, you know, the, the, they, they were very proud of that because they were a new wave. Anytime you're young and you think you're hot stuff, you, you are that way. So we were young, we thought we were hot stuff, and it was fun. I had hair in the late 60s, I had hair down my shoulders, and was anti-war, anti-war kind of guy, and, uh, you know, peace and love, and, you know, and, and some of the same trappings, if not all of them. But it was fun to have some old football writer who'd be at a game on Sunday and have somebody from the, you know, the Dallas paper or the Philadelphia paper or somebody nudging and saying, who's that? You know, you could kind of hear that in the press room. So it's it's why I have a lot of. Um, of course, now, nowadays I think of I think of the young baseball writers as being so driven and conservative, uh, and that they're always I don't know what they're doing with their thumbs. Can anybody explain that to me? What they're doing all the time? They're hunched over their machine. We used to argue about stuff in the press box. We used to argue about politics or food or where we were going out that night or you know which we had the better view of the of the girls in the stands. It was all guys in those days. And we were always engaged in stuff. We weren't as busy. But now all my young colleagues, all, all they do is like that. So if you can explain to me what they're doing, I, I think I'm missing on the trend. All right, so offsides and the thumbs. We've got to deal with that when, when we're The done. thumb generation. All they right. don't argue. They don't talk. So Dick Young, older breed guy, still around very much a force in the early 60s. Well, the, the, the chipmunks, the group that I think my personal opinion is started the modern era mm -hmm. of, of like, sports media. He, he certainly did. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that, that way, in, in, in opening up, asking questions, being a pain in the neck in the clubhouse, yeah. and being fearless. He was a, if you, I don't, maybe this is a name from the past too, but any image you have of Frank Sinatra, this kind of argumentative, uh, loudmouth, doing it my way, that kind of personality. I don't know who did the, you know, the current culture of pop culture, but, but Dick Young was, was a hard guy, and he didn't care who liked him or didn't. He was going to get a story, and he was the, the leader of us. If When television came along, uh, people like Howard Cosell would pop in there and stick out a microphone, or, or a camera crew would come in with, and say, all right, we're going to go live. And I learned my lesson very well from Dick Young, which is what's the first thing you do when you got an annoying person from television uh, got me away is you cursing their microphone, uh, and we, we used to, I mean, and, and you're right. Uh, newspaper columnists and newspaper reporters were celebrities. I mean, this was a, the world that I came into uh, in, in the in the '60s. I mean, famous names of the past like Grantland Rice or older guys like like Red Smith or even Dick Young, who was more of my cup of tea than some of the the more sedate sports columnists. But we thought, I mean, baseball writers and then sports columnists thought they were the king of the roost. Radio didn't really, you know, it was nice, but sports was not a big business. And television was only beginning to move in. And then when people came in with microphones and with, with television cameras, it was like the cattle herders and the sheep herders in, in the Western movie where you were fighting for your turf. I learned from young is to be defensive, not to be afraid, not to give an inch to these people because there was no law that said that a TV crew had the right to interrupt. And, and chipmunks, the thing we, we thought we were different in, we like to psychoanalyze ballplayers after a game. It's always always interesting, a guy has a bad day at the plate and now he's in the locker and he's you know, stripping down to his uh, undies or something and he's smoking a cigarette in the old days. You know, Roger Maris smoking a cigarette after a game in the locker room, which he did. And you'd be going up talking to the guy and saying, well, how come you went over for today or why are you having a slump or this or that? 
And you didn't appreciate being interrupted. There's a law that says a camera crew can come in there. But I learned my lesson from Dick Young. So in, the, in the 1981 or 82 playoffs, I was in a locker after a, a night playoff game in Los Angeles. I was in, I was in a clubhouse interviewing Mike Socia, who's now the manager of the, the Angels. Socia was a good guy. He was also very big and could take a charge at the plate as well as anybody. And, and we're talking to Socia about other things and psychoanalyzing them, and he's being very nice. He's talking about it. In comes the, the Howard Cosell of, of Los Angeles, a guy named Stu Nagan with a camera crew, and he's, he's live. He's, he, he flies and he sticks out the thing. He says, okay, we're going live to talk to Mike Socia. What are you doing? He cursed into his microphone. I said, you know, and such and such, you're not doing such and such. So because they have to, now I get in a fight with the guy, not a physical fight. But here's, you're looking at a six foot three catcher backing into the locker. You know, like, you guys, could you please, like, don't, don't do this around me. Social, like, he didn't want any part of it. But I'm having it out with the, this annoying television guy. And that night I took a red eye from Los Angeles back to New York. And they had a movie on it. It was one of the uh, Rocky movies. And I'm half asleep, and I don't watch movies, but I open my eyes, and in the Rocky movie, where this guy I've just had a fight with, he's got a, a bit role as the annoying television broadcaster. And now in the middle of my airplane in red eye sleep, I have to see this guy all over again. But that was the kind of border wars that were going on. And I can tell you, since we're talking about journalism here, it was a losing battle. We lost. Now, we, we lost the war because now newspapers are diminishing, they're going away. Television and, and you know, the beast of television and the web and all the underwear guys who don't even, don't even come in the clubhouse. And they, they brag being home in their underwear that they know what's happening. They know all about sports because they're smart guys. So they're writing on the web about things they're not covering. So newspaper people, the people that actually go and endure the... The, uh, the circumstances and learn and ask questions and dig and ferret around. We've lost the war. There are fewer papers, there are fewer of us. I was counting heads at the US Open recently, uh, the tennis tournament, and I was counting the people that weren't there. You know, my buddy Dale Robertson from the Houston paper, his paper doesn't send him to the US Open anymore. My pal Michelle Kaufman from the Miami Herald. These are papers, Miami Herald wants a really good paper, and it's just it's just flimsy nothing anymore. Newsday doesn't send anybody to the World Cup anymore with the paper I grew up with. Uh, Newsday has become just a, a, a rag. It's owned by a, a cable company called Cablevision. They're a bunch of ditch, ditch diggers who came to own cable companies. And, uh, and I'm literally, glad, literally, why did you do that? Give your opinion Literally, tonight, literally, so. literally <laughs> ditch diggers, as a matter of fact. And, and we've lost the war. I mean, they, they own it and they, they come through. So it's, it's kind of fun to be in a minority. It's kind of fun to be a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm part Irish and I got an Irish passport. It's kind of fun to be a, a cranky, uh, a cranky uh, minority. Uh, well, that sets the stage very well. So 1960s, I think we're starting to see TV become a force. Uh, we could talk about radio and how that's changed. I think we'll we'll pass on that for tonight. We'll we'll deal with radio and right. here in the next few weeks. But TV becomes a huge part of how we learn about our sports. Less Dick Young, more Howard Cosell. Mm -hmm. uh, in nineteen sixties, we still have some wonderful old baseball players who uh, the mail hangs it up and Koufax hangs it up. So we're starting to see the transition on the field. Stan Musial, who we'll come back and, and talk about a little bit in a little while, hangs it up. A new breed of players, we, we start seeing the advent of TV, um, maybe more football oriented than anything else. How has that impacted right up through today? You, now looking back, you see the beginnings of it. Now let's go to today. What's, what's um, TV done? to what you do and how you try and get your message across as a columnist in the New York Times. What's the difference? Well, first of all, the access is much more limited. It's so much more built up. The time that you have around athletes, and baseball has a wide open clubhouse, but when you go into the, the, the Yankee clubhouse and the near new stadium and the Met clubhouse in their ballpark are beautiful rooms, they're huge, but there's no ball players in them. They dress somewhere else. What is called a clubhouse is sort of a staging area, and you can come in after a game and there's not one player there. So in the old days, you had players crowded together, and it, we were allowed in there, of course, and we had the right to be there. 
and the players had to be there. There was no other place for them to go. So you'd see the key man in his locker. He might snarl and tell you where to go, but they were around. They also, it was not a very sophisticated era. They had not come along. They were not comfortable meeting the press in any way, the electronic or written press. Nowadays, just about any athlete you ever meet is has grown up with television, has grown up as a star back in, you know, in his country, and in his, in, his, in his neighborhood, he was the best athlete, and they know how to act in front of the camera, they're very poised, so they're very comfortable with the ordinary interview. They may not, they, they may not, it, it takes away from the spontaneity to some degree, but they are in control of their lives, they know how to deal, they know how to put out what they want to put out, and the problem is that you, you can't break through the facade of the athlete who doesn't want to be broken through. And the same thing is true with the coaches. I mean, when, when Pat Riley was the coach of the Knicks, Pat's a bright guy, I got to know him, but he would come out, he would give his little spiel after the game, and then he'd say, okay, got enough, and bam, he'd be in the back to, 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 to his smoking room, and, and you, couldn't, uh, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't push him, whereas other coaches in the past, you, you could hang around them more. So I think athletes are more, more sophisticated today. The rules are more codified, where you can't, you, you can't necessarily get at them. You can't stay around and talk to them in the same way because they're a little too smart for you. But, but there's also a veneer. Some athletes are terrific. I mean, you, you, you find one in a hundred that, that will stay around and talk. I mean, the, the a Tiki Barber who played for the Giants, or you know, you get a couple of guys who played for the Knicks. You get used to them, but. Their, their way in the minority just because they don't have to be. And one of the nice things that's so honest about, about sports, in a sense, if you want to call it honest, is that back in the day when I came along, players made pretty much the same. The average player made sort of the same economics that the reporter did. I mean, I, I had the same concerns in the mid-60s for uh, you know, driving my car north or how much it cost me to go to spring training the players that I was close to, and I, you, know, you, you tend not to be close to the stars, but guys I got to know, a guy named Bill Robinson played for the Yankees, and Lord Lumbery, one of my, my best friends in, in baseball, he had the same, the same concerns. He had his wife was pregnant, he was in spring training, he had no way to get her back, he did, you know, it cost a couple of hundred dollars. I'd say, walk up, Bill, I'll drive, I'll drive your car, and I'll drive Mary home, she, she was pregnant, and, you know, and so on. But, but the, the point being that we, we all thought about a few hundred dollars here and there. Life now gets, the players have so much money that they don't even need the reputation of being good guys. You know, in, in the 60s, there were athletes who were known as good guys. They thought that somehow it would be an extra thousand dollars in their paycheck because they could say to the general manager, look, above everything else, I stand around and I talk to those idiots from the press, and the general manager might toss a thousand dollars and say, you're right, you get a lot of stories, you get... Nowadays, none of that matters. Good guys don't matter. What matters is your bargaining position, your agent, and it's, it's honest, it's open. They also feel that if they make $7 million a year, Joe Namath once, once called somebody from Time Magazine, this was back in 64 or 65, the guy tried to interview him at a bar somewhere in Manhattan, and Joe Namath called him a you know, $200 a week creep. And, and the guy was very insulted because he said, you know, Time Magazine would make $250 a week. Or three but, but the point was that, that Namath was onto something, and it's only gotten wider since then. The players make so much money that we don't, they don't have to pretend to really like us or need us, and, and vice versa. So it's not warfare, it's just there's a huge gap, and we're writing about a different phenomenon. We're writing about something else. But how does that translate to the fan? It seems like today we have... We know more about the players, although I'm not so sure that's true. But in the Ross example, we're seeing footage of people that they post themselves where they're naked and, the, you know, anything shows up on the Internet. So athletes are now communicating with us directly instead right. of through right. reporters, right. writers. Right. How is that impacting the fan and their perception? and how we respond to sports. It's, it's all showbiz, and, and it's hard to tell what's real and what's not. I, I will admit, I have not joined the, you know, I was kidding around before about it, but I have not joined the social network generation. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. Um, I'm too busy working as a writer. But I do understand that players do have control of their, 
they're blackberries. They are sending out messages. That's they the are thumb. putting the thumb, the thumb thing. I, I, I really do know what it is. And I, I know that a lot of them are they're smart, they're smart people, and they know what they're doing. So they're putting out a message. Um, you know, wow, kind of weird today at the ballpark, or did you hear the news about such and such? And it's from their heart. That's the language of the, of, the, uh, of the social network. And they are putting out things that they feel, or things that they want to put out. I mean, how do you separate the two? I mean, it's hard to tell. But, but they do have more control over the, the, the message, the image, the words that they want to do. If I want to know what, what an athlete thinks, uh, because I work for the New York Times, if I've got 15 minutes or a couple of hours, I'll put in a call to the athlete, to his agent, to his team publicist, somehow or other, and I can get calls back. I mean, some athletes really, you know, Lance Armstrong will, will call me back most of the time if I want to ask a question because he knows that I'm reasonably polite with him and, you know, in all, in all the controversies. Um, but, but a lot of the younger reporters are, you know, I wasn't kidding around before, but they are plugged into what the athletes are putting out. They know that. So some of my colleagues are coming up with, you know, somebody just got traded and is kind of bummed by it, and has put out a Twitter on deadline. <coughs> one of my younger colleagues, somebody who's really into that, is going to be finding it and getting it into the paper. And I, I recognize that. And, and I think it's, it's a fine way for the athlete to beat us to the punch. Why wait for us to show up in front of the locker room? Or to track them down, it's it's partially for their image. I mean, it's their their control, it's their world, but it's also a way of getting out whatever they want to get out to tell the story that they want to tell and they're being proactive about it. And how, how can I argue with that? If it's all communication, they're certainly communicating. There was a gentleman who was supposed to be here tonight who's going to come in November. Uh, wonderful guy, great writer, John Hellier. He wrote a wonderful book about baseball, uh, Lords of the Realm. Uh, and the first line in the book was, and he wrote this, the very last line that he wrote was the first line of the book. He, he told me in, in a session one time. The first line was, before it was a business, it was a game. Right? Okay. Talking about baseball. He wrote that in 1994. Uh, because that's where his book ended. Do you agree that this is now sports are major business? And when did that happen? Who, who, when was the first professional baseball team? Late 1800s? 1869. Right. Cincinnati. I assembled 10 or 11 players, gave them other jobs, but they were paid to be piano tuners or school teachers. They did it in their spare time. 1869, the first free agent. It wasn't really Andy Messersmith in 1974. It was a guy named Albert Spaulding who found a way to jump from the Cincinnati team, they moved to Boston, and then he jumped to Chicago. Uh, all Boston in mourning was a headline in the Boston paper. This was, I think, 1874. So Spaulding was, he was, a, and he later became a general manager and owner of a team and founded Spaulding Sporting Goods. He was an entrepreneurial guy, smart enough to know that he could, he could beat a contract he could get away from. I think it was always a business, maybe not when they were playing in 1839 on the fields in Manhattan, um, the Knickerbocker Baseball Club, but by 1869, some guys were getting paid to play baseball in the Midwest. And by, by a few years later, Albert Spaulding was making hundreds and hundreds of more dollars in those years by, by jumping. So I, I, I don't agree, I don't agree with that. I think that athletes, certainly by the 20th century, some of the labor things that went on. I mean, the strikes, the holdouts, people couldn't make enough money and wound up, you know, they'd get out of baseball because they could make more money staying home and working for their father-in-law, um, you know, in, a, in, a, in a, some business or other. So I, I think that it's always been about money, that if, if you couldn't afford to play baseball, you, 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 couldn't, you couldn't afford to be there, you'd go home and, and do something else. Um, I know players have held out for a whole year. Ed Rouch, who's a Hall of Fame center fielder for the Cincinnati Reds, he held out for a whole year in 1920 or 21, something like that. Just didn't play because the Reds weren't giving him a lot. Of, so, so long before you know, huge cable television money came in and before baseball became big business, people still were struggling to how to support themselves, how to make a living, and I mean, all you have to do, Ralph Franca, the great pitcher for the Dodgers. 
uh, who gave up the famous home run in 1951. I once walked into a meeting in the United States Capitol honoring Jackie Robinson, and I walked in, happened to meet Ralph Franca, and he's going to honor his, his late teammate in the U.S. Capitol. And Franca saw the grandson of Branch Rickey, who was the general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers back in the day. And Branca, I said, do you know Branch Rickey III? And Branca said to me, that old son of a bitch, his grandfather, he knocked me out of a, a, a thousand dollars one year because he said I walked too many people the year before. He's, it, it's, it's 2004, and Ralph Branca was mad about a salary dispute that happened in 1947 where they got his grandfather. I mean, they, they were, you know, money was important back in those days. He felt the man took money out of his pocket generations earlier. So I, I think it was always about money. Always a business, but much bigger now. Sure. sure. And, and so I, I love the idea that ball players make a lot of money. And the reason is I come from a union family. I come from a working class family. My parents were, were union organizers, were, were newspaper people. And they had to work very hard. They had to get knocked over by uh, strike breakers and uh, police horses and pushed around on strikes to, to get a, a working wage. If athletes have enough clout to make the money, if somebody said, what do you think about um, you know, Derek Jeter's contract? My answer is, I'd rather see Derek Jeter make the money, have that money, than George Steinbrenner. I suspect the Steinbrenner family and George's heirs still are making a lot of money. You've run the business, but I, you know, I, I, I was happier thinking about uh, your ballplayers having the money than, than the people you work with. Does that make sense? It, it sort of does. I'd still like to have a little bit more money for the owners, but... <laughs> but, but, that's, but that's the tension. I mean, and, that, and, that's, and, that's, and that's the way it works. I mean, that's, that is the way it works. Is it, it, there, is a, there is a tension between labor and management, but because I'm coming from a labor point of view, if somebody tells me that a guy... I mean, I can say, well, that guy's overpaid, but he might be overpaid because of his relative skills. The club might have made a mistake. You know, what were they doing giving a guy a four-year contract? all that money. That's a different case. But then there are players who are, who are underpaid and they have their best years and never get that money because they, they blow their knee out uh, when it's time to make the big money. So I, I feel for athletes that are not going to make it, uh, come close and don't make it. Let me switch gears a little bit on some ethics and covering issues, ethical issues in sports. The, the biggest one that we talked about today is steroids. Uh, and performance enhancing drugs. Uh, the, obviously, the biggest name is one that you mentioned, maybe not the biggest, but certainly one of the bigger names, where there's this potential taint is right here in Austin with Lance Armstrong. Roger Clemens, another uh, famous Yankee pitcher, Texan, uh, going through a trial. Barry Bonds, our uh, arguably the, uh, the home run king, although I say arguably, uh, we could have a real debate on that as well. During the 1990s, it was pretty apparent, I think, and, and I was there for part of it, so I'll, uh, my own opinion is in there. It, it was pretty apparent that guys were showing up to the ballpark, they're bigger, they're stronger, um, you see them in the clubhouse and there's acne all over their back. Their head size is now eight and a half and it used to be a seven and a half. Um, a lot of the telltale signs, as we now know, of guys using performance enhancing drugs. It was pretty obvious after at least a few years of that in the clubhouse and writers are in the clubhouse, reporters are in the clubhouse other forms of media in the clubhouse. And yet there wasn't a whole lot said. As a matter of fact, the one writer, and I, his name escapes me, you probably know who it is or you know who I'm Steve, talking Steve about. Wilson. Yes. Associated Press. Associated Press. Sees the bottle of Androstein Dion in um, Mark McGuire's locker, which I happen to believe was placed there intentionally by Mark McGuire, but that's just my own personal opinion that he wanted it seen. Uh, but regardless, he sees it, he writes about it, and he is absolutely condemned by a lot of his colleagues who preferred to see 
the home run race, and of course Major League Baseball, I think, wanted to see a home run race. Do you think going back that it should have been done different, that the players should have been called out, was there an obligation or responsibility on the part of the writers, or are they there just to write about the baseball season? Although I think the chipmunks would disagree, would, would, should they have just ignored some of the telltale signs? Um, I, I, I'll give you an answer. I don't feel particularly good about my role in being in the clubhouse in those years. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think I covered myself with glory or that my business did. On the other hand, we did hear some of those, you know, there was the conjecture. Sure. Uh, I was once walking with a doctor friend of mine on the beach in Florida, and he's an orthopedic guy, and he was pointing out to me uh, people that he thought took steroids. He was just looking at people's bills, you know, looking at male, you know, athlete types and all. He was saying, look at the acting on this one, look at the muscles on that one. And he was making judgments. I mean, but he wasn't putting it in the paper. He wasn't making medical judgments. He was only gossiping as we walked down the beach. But it's the same thing in a clubhouse. If, if a player takes off his shirt, and we're around players taking off their clothes, if a player takes off his shirt and you see acne across his back and somebody nudges somebody and it's like, whoa, pizza bag, you know? Now, that, and we would call each other that. But it's not the same thing as me going to a laptop and writing so-and-so um, is has 25 home runs and it's July and the most home runs he's ever hit is 12 and he's got acne on his back and his muscles are bigger. It, I, it, I worked for the New York Times. Kathleen would have fired me. I would have been out of business. I mean, just take it out. <laughs> exactly. So, so the point, the, the point being that in, in a responsible journalistic setting, I'm not even going to throw innuendo in there. I'm not going to say, you know, so and so. Um, and, and there was whispers of it. I mean, I, I think I threw stuff in, in between the lines, or you suggested, or you asked. But it wasn't the kind of thing I was prepared to write in a column. I didn't have enough evidence. When Steve Wilstein did, I certainly was not one to condemn him. I know him. He's a good he's he's a good reporter, and he wrote it. But I also look back at the stuff I wrote in '98. Very few references to it, even though I was in St. Louis for that McGuire uh, Sosa weekend in, in Chicago in uh, St. Louis. I covered that when McGuire uh, you know, broke quote broke Roger Maris's record, but. I didn't think that anybody had the, the, the I said I wasn't going to write a column saying this is a tainted record because of the vial of, uh, I mean, Andro was not illegal by baseball right. rules at the time, and I, and I think I know you and I could go trace this backwards. If we all had our suspicions, if you in management, if I in uh, or ownership had, had, um, had, had our suspicions, why didn't we have a piece of paper on, on any of these guys? And the answer is, well, the union didn't permit that kind of testing. And it was a union management issue. The union dragged its heels a long time. I have a lot of issues as a union guy, as somebody who grew up in a, in a real union, I have a lot of issues with the Players Association, and particularly the guy that ran it for a long time, named Donald Fear. I, I have a lot of issues with, with some of his you know, tactics and, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, his way of doing things. One of the things they did was, was scream civil liberties and, and, and rights as a way to keep people from being tested. So when they went to bargaining, they, they didn't have to do it. Ultimately, they were forced, they were shamed into it, and that's what happened. Testing, testing, and then first testing came in, and then penalties came in afterward because of a series of, of things that just became obvious as time went on. I do believe in time. I do believe that time takes care of these things. It doesn't much bother me that, Mar that um, McGuire and Bonds and Sosa have all these home runs because you can't take them back. You can't, they, they count. You're not going to take the home runs away from somebody because the pitchers gave them up. The pitchers were juicing too. So you can't, you can't, you know, you can't play games with numbers. What you can do is you can think you know what happened. And from the testimony, I was there when McGuire was in Congress. I saw him make a fool of himself. I, I think Sosa made a fool of himself that day. 
by suddenly claiming he couldn't speak English very well. Because uh, I've been interviewing the guy for years, and he spoke English very well. They, they, they all, Raphael Palmero with the, the Bill Clinton figure, you know, I did not have, uh, you know, steroids with this so-and-so, you know, whatever, whatever he said, they, they kind of blur my mind. People have lied to me in public, they lied to us in public. But we know, we know in our hearts the kind of mother wit sense of that we all have. And so I'm fine with going forward the next decade or so. If it, I don't vote for the Hall of Fame, if I did vote, I think I'd have a hard time voting for any of those guys. You know, Clemens, Bonds, McGuire, Sosa, just because. I think they, I think they used it. I think they lied. I think they've been shamed in public. Uh, that's good enough for me. And by now, by what's come out, by the, the snitches and, the, and, and the, the government going after and some of the trials, even if they weren't legally convicted, uh, we have a pretty good idea what went on, and I'm fine with that. Let's use our common sense, and we can now write about it, and uh, my editors won't take it up. You just mentioned you don't vote for the Hall of Fame. Um, that's a New York Times right. policy, I think, right. that anyone who covers the sport can't vote for the election of its the most the highest honor, I guess. Right. I mean, more to the point is the Times doesn't allow us to vote for any awards. They don't allow its drama people or TV critics to vote for Emmys or Oscars or you know, any of that stuff because they don't want us to be part of the, uh, they don't allow us to score a baseball game. To some of the official scorers, some newspaper people are allowed to be official scorers, uh, but I saw enough of that in the 60s where uh, a reporter gave Mickey Mantle a very questionable base hit late in the season uh, when Mickey was going for a, a batting championship and it was a, a total error by the uh, infielder but the official scorer, I won't say what paper, gave it, it wasn't the Times, gave a, a base hit to Mantle. After the game was over, the Yankees were distributing World Series tickets. This was before the playoffs. The World Series tickets were around, the Yankees were in the... And Mantle had his World Series tickets, you know, five days before the season ended. And Mantle went up to the scorer with a fistful of tickets and said, Hey, Jim, how many of these do you want? <laughs> and basically, Man was putting down the guy who had leaned over backwards to give him a homeward decision to help him. Uh, Times doesn't want us to be active. Right. Um, so, befriending athletes, right. an issue, is there an issue with that? Is there an issue today where it seems like athletes and writers, journalists, TV people are buds? Does, does that affect how we get our news? I know I can't I can't speak for TV people and and the buzz stuff that's all showbiz. I mean a lot of it is showbiz and and the athletes are happy to be because if, we, if I can generalize, I think the athletes know that the TV people are part of showbiz and are gonna they have a symbiotic relationship and are gonna make these guys look good on television. They're gonna talk about their dinners and going yard and all the cliches of the ESPN and Fox and all that stuff. And, it, and, and, and they're all in that business together. We're not in that business as newspaper people. It's not our job to glorify people. Um, so they're wary of us as well they should be. The honesty I was talking about before. I think it's a more honest relationship. But, but they're pretty good at it. They know how to, how to perform. They, when somebody comes by, hey, slug, come on over here. That's you and me. I mean, the, the business of a lot of the TV celebrities is, uh, you know, I'm in this together. And, and, it's an act, it's fine, it's showbiz. I don't confuse that with journalism. I, I don't, I, I've had a hard time thinking of journalism and, and, uh, and, uh, and TV, you know, in any conversation. Although well, I'm willing to say that some people are more perceptive, you know, they're already exception. I mean, Costas has a glimmer of things and, you know, some of the, some of the news programs are okay. But I, I just think it's a different business. In that sense, not even that's, that's where I'm coming from. I'm going to go to two other subjects, and to do that, I want to have Kathleen come down and participate with us. Come on down. Come on down, Kathleen. Come on down. Let me let me let me say this as, as Kathleen comes down. Kathleen has been uh, um, an editor, assistant deputy editor at the New York Times Sports Section. She's had a lot of other jobs at the paper, um, including she was the weekend editor, the weekend at Challenger, blew up. And she's now coming back to her native Texas to, to go for a doctorate. She, she went straight, she got out of the business, and uh, I, I also, I'll embarrass her even further by saying she's, she's uh, part of our family, and my wife and I are down here visiting her. And I almost killed them. 
<laughs> I tried to drive up to Lake Travis, Lake Austin, and it wasn't pretty because I don't drive really because I lived in New York for 25 years. They're dangerous. We're here. We live to tell the tale. And I had a good dinner in the booth. So, so the point being, this is, this is a big time editor from the New York Times who was indeed one of my bosses for a number of years. Uh, kept, kept us going, rewrote us, uh, took care of us, and is now uh, you know, back, back home in her home state. Oh, I, I don't even need it. Good. Well, recording. well, we are recording, okay. so uh, I'm going to share. <laughs> I'm going to lean over and yell at, uh, at, at your microphone. How's that? Okay. Uh, a couple things. I want to talk, uh, I'll save the, the new book of George's for last, and I'm interested in your thoughts about George as well, but uh, I want to talk about blogging and new media. Uh, as much as George is having us believe that he's not quite sure what those thumbs do, I noticed that he's been blogging. He can blog, and I want to review a couple of things. I've been taking notes. George is a great journalist and reporter. If you read his columns, there's reporting going on. It's not just opinion. This is reported assessments and essays. So that whole thing, I'm not a journalist, I'm not a reporter, just forget that. Okay. <laughs> On the other end, the reason why people are in their underwear is if you're live blogging, you don't have time to get up and brush your teeth and put on clothes. I don't know if any of you have blogged on a regular basis, but you're busy. That's all you do. You're sitting there all day if it's an event. If you're blogging, you know, matches or, you know, Arab Spring, you can get a little distracted. So some of those guys are legitimately in their underwear. They just haven't had time to get up. There's the picture, Arab Spring, men in their underwear. And Davis Cup. And Davis Cup. <laughs> not, not a pretty concept. <laughs> okay. Um, blogging. George, I notice, has been blogging on a lot of subjects. And so what's the future of blogging, and will it replace what we know as print media? I'll turn that to both of you. Um, Blogging is a subset of media, of web media, and um, it might even be passé now. Blogging for a lot of mainstream publications, like the Times, is a platform. It is not a journalistic concept. It's not the same as sitting down and write, if you're blogging your own personal ideas. The main reason why quote-unquote blogging is popular is because it is e more efficient technically a lot of times to be on WordPress or Blogspot or any of those other things that you guys are on. It turns out all the mainstream publications are also on those things. So it's not quote unquote blogging in the traditional um, lone blogger sense, but more in the, if you ever saw Singing in the Rain, we're about to have one of those type of accidents. Um, if you saw the movie, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> Serena. You know, I'd rather know that at 
9 o'clock at night than wait till the next day. Maybe I want you know, to be a part of that conversation. If there is no reason to wait for information, then you can put it up. Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. Um, as I said, you know, for George, maybe the new step for him is blogging. If you're Brian Sel uh, Stelzer, Stelzer, one of our um, media columnists, and, uh, media reporters, I don't know if you guys have seen page one, the movie about the New York Times. You know, Brian tweets everything. You know, Brian would just assume not even blog. He would just rather tweet the whole thing and don't make him write the story. And sometimes, you know, you could go back and write a complete, you know, reported article based on Brian's tweets. Um, so, you know, different people have different comfort zones with, and he's just shaking his head like, oh, no. Um, so, in one sense, if you can get the information up early and there's no reason for it not to be up, or if there's a rain delay and George has an interesting thought about rain delays in the U.S. Open and he wants to write 300 words on it, he can do that. He's not going to write 300 words for the paper. Well, you had a lot of time for this year's U.S. Open to write 300 Sing it, words. Singing in the rain. Singing in the rain. Blog, blogging in the rain. Um, so, do you like blogging? I've noticed that you've covered uh, soccer, women's hoops, uh, women's basketball, baseball. Uh, and blogs? And I've seen blogs where you comment. Yeah, I, I have. Uh, some of them were hit, hit or miss. I did a lot of them during the U.S. Open. And there's a reason for it, which is that we, in the, the, the new sports department, an editor spoke to me intelligently and asked me to, could I contribute more of blogs because he was trying to beef up his esteem. For mm -hmm. And was a really good guy, has a great background in it. And it was the first time that I'd ever seen the concept where somebody had said, while the US Open is on, we're going to be doing this blog item called straight sets. If you could get some stuff, there was a there was a a meeting of the minds. He spoke to me rationally. I knew what he wanted, I knew what he needed, I was able to respond to it as opposed to what I heard from from some other people. Kathleen's been out of the department a long time. It's not me. I right, it's not don't care. But, but I, I have heard from some, you know, sometimes it'll be, well if you have anything left over, just kind of, you know, it sounded like I, I think of a lot of stuff on the web as toenail clippings, you know, the kind of stuff you do, and then you flick it out, and if it gets in the... I, I, as a columnist, I want to think about what I'm doing, and I have a hard time releasing thoughts. I, I've done some things as blogs, and, and nobody saw them, and I realized I'd wasted... The, the one I did from Lexington during the, during the, the, the sub-regional, where I stopped, it was the opening day, long story. Mary Todd Lincoln House, right next door to Rupp Arena. I went on a tour of it. I got a tour. Somebody took me. I read a book on Mary Todd Lincoln. I wrote about her life and the things that she had learned from the slave woman who raised her. I wrote a whole blog about that and kind of juxtaposed it to basketball because I knew I was going to go and do a basketball column. I just wanted to write about it. And I put in a blog, and I got six people commented on me being sensitive to the juxtaposition of the Mary Todd Lincoln House and uh, Rupp Arena. Later in the day, I wrote a column of, of, of another blog where I said that the University of Pennsylvania was trying to catch up with Princeton as an Ivy League basketball power. I got 7,000 uh, emails from Penn graduates saying, don't you know that we were in the final four, and blah, 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 blah. And so when you, when you hit the hornet's nest, of fan interest, you suddenly, and, and I learned my lesson, which is don't write things that I would write in a column in the paper. Don't waste them on people who are having sports, um, you know, sports anxiety, sports uh, interest. Stick it a little bit closer to the subject. And I did that during the, but, but it's a hard thing to do. I mean, it also depends very much on the audience. I mean, George is going to get a million people reading him in print. If he writes a blog post, and by the way, even though the web is unlimited, if nobody knows that you've written anything, it doesn't matter. The tree falls in the forest. And it doesn't that. matter. So if he writes this great blog post, and let's say he'd written that on a day that it was a slow news day. So let's put it on the homepage. Let's get a piece of art to go with it. Then all of a sudden, a bazillion people see the same column 
And, you know, and also the other thing is that people tend to comment when they are pushed. Uses and gratifications. I'm in research and theory now. And um, so, he, you know, people might have read your column. Now I can actually tell them the number of eyeballs who looked at that column. They might have read it and said, oh, that's nice and done nothing. But, you know. That's what I always tell myself. When I don't get a lot of responses, I say, people, people run it, but they, they like it, but they didn't. Another side note on comments, because I'm doing research in it, one, 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 one million, no, one ten thousandth of the people who read blogs in the New York Times actually comment. So very few people will ever comment on a Times blog. What about a Times column? No, on anything that's on a Times website, very few people are going to. You may see 500 comments. I did a 9-11 thing where we had 47,000 comments on a map about 9-11. And that still only represented very few people who actually looked at the map. So that's just a side note on the comments. All right. Quick switch. I had the class read just before you came in one of your recent comment, or columns which um, took on a dicey issue, Serena Williams. Uh, yeah, let's talk about Serena. Let's talk. <laughs> Everybody read the column, right? I don't know whether you'd seen it in the Times a couple of weeks ago. I was actually going to write a note to George the day he was there. I knew I would see him, so I said, that's okay. We'll just talk about it in class. That's probably worse. Um, you took on the tough subject uh, with Serena Williams, and I think the class knows what your take was on it. Um, easy to do, hard to do, uh, an obligation to do? Could you have just passed that one by? What drove you to write your comments about she, Serena that day? She did a thing on national and world television, so I, I, I couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't pretend you didn't see it. Um, and people were talking about it. I mean, by the time I went back, it was already, we had already blogged it. Somebody there had already said Serena Williams has outburst, is blah, blah, blah. Uh, so, I mean, it's horrible. It exists in the public consciousness like that. And then the Times is already, so, so if I don't write about it, I'm going to look like a fool. Now, the question is. Your column adds an opinion element. Right, right. And I had, the, the match started at 4 o'clock. The outburst was at 4. I was sitting in the stands. I, I, I didn't feel, I knew the women's match is not reliable to go more than two hours. So I had time was on my side. I worked very fast. I happened to be blessed with ability to work fast. And I was very comfortable that whatever happened, ordinary match, you know, I'll be able to write it, probably get some quotes from the two athletes before the 7.30, 8 o'clock deadline. When this happened, I knew that I, there had to be a column. Whether Williams won or lost the match, it didn't really matter. Uh, because she made this, and, and the history to it was two years ago when she had this outburst against the line official, uh, forfeited the last point of the match and you know, forfeited her semifinal. So, it, because there was a history, it, it, it was a no brainer to me. I didn't even have to think about it. The real question was even as far as, as, as what I believed or what I thought, if I didn't go. To, to the, if I didn't make the point that I made, I would have been holding back, I would have been withholding my opinion. I've been around those uh, players, the, the, the two sisters and their family, since they, since they broke into tennis. Now, I covered Venus' first match at uh, Wimbledon. I've uh, been around them. I've spent time with uh, their mother. Uh, we had a friend and you know, colleague of ours who had, gave me access to them for a while, who was close to them. Um, so I, I, I feel like I know them pretty well. I've written a lot of sympathetic things about them you know, they, they were, when they were 14 and 16, when, when Richard Williams was saying, you know, Venus is going to be a great player, she's going to be a champion, but look out for the younger one, she's the real tough one, she'll, you know, and, and Richard would talk about how Serena was, was the fighter in the family. So he's been telling us that she is the competitor and the tough one in the family, Everything is played out along that line. She is she's a great champion. But to see those two acts within three years, I cover a lot of sports, I cover a lot of people. Uh, I think I understand it, it had to do with, the, with the, the rules of tennis, the etiquette of tennis, and I felt these were both so far over the line that what she did that day had to be commented on particularly when she came into the interview room 
and there were a lot of reporters asking her the questions. And I, you know, I could have, I could have dug up. If you want to look up our comments, go to a website called ASAP. I think it's .com, ASAP.com. Find their section on the U.S. Open, and then you can find Serena's comment. The questions were pretty good. A lot of the reporters were saying, "Serena, did you understand?" I mean, and, and by the way, it's first name basis because we all know each other, and it's not, you know, there's no condescension there. We all, you know, we're all in this together. And the, the question would be, "Did you know that this was happening? Why did you say this? Are you sorry now? Do you think you behaved the right way when you?" brandished your racket when you called a woman a hater, blah, blah, blah. And the answer is you can't hear the tone of voice in the, uh, in the transcript, but you can guess from it that it's a disassociated, well, I don't remember. I, you use the I, term sing-song. Sing-song. She has a sing-song. Both, both of them have this sing-song way, which I find quite patronizing. There's, I'm around a lot of athletes. Most of them know enough to be a little bit more polite, you know, to, to, and it's not polite, to more direct. If you ask a question, they'll confront you. This is like, I don't even have to give you an answer. What I'm telling you is, I don't remember. I was out there in the heat of battle, and, uh, you know, if you tell me, I, don't, I just don't know. And I find that insulting to my intelligence as a reporter, that an athlete would sit there and say, I don't really remember, it doesn't matter, let's move on, um, we're going to go forward. That, to me, is like just saying, you know, I don't have to answer to anybody, and I think they do. I think there's a public out there, and you know, it's not a matter of young kids watching or behavior or anything like that. It's the general etiquette of the sport. What I did get the next day, I mean, I got a couple of different layers of, of emails. Um, one of them said, when John McEnroe was acting out, what did you write about him? Well, I knew I was okay on that one, because McEnroe comes from the same part of the city as I do, and when he was acting out as a young guy, I was already a sports columnist, I called him out on it as a, as a punk. I called him fried, uh, which has its own connotations. You know, I knew where he was at and some of the rage that he was going through. I ripped it. I remember back in 1982 or 83, I got a letter from my homeroom teacher in high school, and she, she had clipped out my column on McEnroe about what a brat he was and how he's got to learn how to behave. And her first sentence is, you're a fine one to talk. <laughs> because she knew me, and she had she had the goods on me. So the point was, I knew where I, I and McEnroe's never talked to me. I've never met him one to one. You know, I've never gone off and talked to him. I've talked to him in groups, but the times when I've seen him, he's given me his shot. He knows where I'm coming from. So I'm fine with uh, ratty tennis players who who don't think they have any responsibility to behave right. I I, I paid my dues with him and, and with Connors, who I like a little bit better, but I also ripped him for the way. Having said all that, the other thing I got, I got, I got some emails from people saying, um, this proves that you are a racist and you can't relate to a strong black personality, a woman who's got a strong athlete's body, you're bothered by all of this. Uh, I, I've been in the business too long and I, you know, my life is too complex. I know where I'm coming from. I'm fine with all of those. People who don't know my answer to those people who wrote those emails is, please go back and look at some of the stories I've wrote over the years. I've written over the years. Um, you know, I gave a few references of people that you know think I'm pretty cool. And I, I don't feel the need to defend it, but I do have answers. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with all of that. Um, having, having said that, did I think it was controversial? Honestly, not. Because if I didn't react viscerally, that's what my job is, is to be visceral. I've been, I've been told by my editors over the years, you know, what do you think the public wants to know? And I didn't even think I was being, I didn't think I was even taking a controversial stand on it. I guess I wasn't surprised by some of the emails. But if I didn't say that, I, I wouldn't be living up to the things that I believe about the way people should behave, that way should behave. Let me ask you a question about that, if I may. And yes. Explain. George called out Serena, not necessarily for what she did on the court, oh, although absolutely. that was part of it. It's what she said after about what she right. did on the court. Right. Good call, bad call, right? Oh, I, I agree because, I mean, there are a couple of things about the column that he wrote. Most of the responses that people have to race will always be racialized. Or anything people have to do with anything 
of people of color, it becomes political, it becomes racialized, it becomes controversial. Race is controversial in America. Always will be, doesn't matter, you know. So, even if you were to do a content analysis of his column, there is nothing racial in his column. You look at the letters to the editor, trash talking, you know, ghetto, stuff like that. The response was racialized, but the column wasn't, even if you didn't agree with it or agree with it. And I think the point he's making was that, because Andy Roddick is a jerk. But he, you know, on the court, he is like, and he lives here in Austin too. But, you know, in the press conference, he tends to admit, I lost control. I, I was, you know, I lost my head. And, you know, I thought the ref, whatever. But this was the second time in her last two U.S. Opens, Serena not only did something that was maybe out of control, but her she never confesses. She never, if not even if the word is confess, she never owes to it. Yeah, acknowledges or right. And you, even if she were to say, "That's what I did out there. It might have been wrong, but that's the way I felt." And you know, I you know. I am what I am, but what I did, I did. But it's almost like, oh, I don't know, there was pressure. Did I say that? <laughs> and I like Serena, I really do. I, you know, I, I am so with Serena, but it's like, did I really do that? Did I just kill somebody? Oh, what did I do? <laughs> so that's the hard part. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, if you think I was tough on Serena, go back and find a column I did on Mark McGuire when he appeared in front of Congress oh. in 2005. I mean, I just said he's ruined his life forever. He made a fool of himself in public. <laughs> I, I, no I have no problem doing that. And this is a, you know, big, big white guy, uh, you know, male, white, you know, whatever, baseball. I mean, it's, it's not... He's not smaller a, now. Yeah, well, right, right. <laughs> Good line. That's, but, but I have no problem with that. I mean, if I, didn't, if I didn't sit there and see him make a fool of himself in front of, uh, you know, where, where congressmen were trying to talk him down while being an idiot, and he couldn't be talked down. You know, um, um, Elijah Cummings from Maryland was trying to help him and, and couldn't help him. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I've been at this a long time. I think my, my responses are, are, are acquired. I know what I'm doing. And I have no problem calling a shot like that. I, 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 didn't, I didn't think it was bigger. And, and I never I never injected race into it. I mean, people, you know, That's right, right. It, it's in the, in the eye of the beholder, but I, I, I didn't think it was an issue. Let, last subject before we go to questions. Um, and, and I would feel uh, bad if we, if we didn't talk about it. You have a fairly new book out about Stan Musial. And um, I, I want to read you uh, what one person said about this. Now, he's going to know who this one was. And if he doesn't, I'd be surprised. Uh, quote, I can say without prejudice, okay with, that it, it is as fine a biography, sports or otherwise, as I have ever read. You know who wrote that? Uh, I think my son. Your son, right? So, you know. uh, so I will say that it is with some prejudice. My, my son David works for the New York Times. He's a, a copy editor of the magazine section. And he blogs that on the magazine section web. Uh, David is not, he tosses around compliments to his parents like manhole covers. Um, and, and he's a very cool guy. He's very, very droll and very cool and very smart. And it, I was thoroughly honored by that. Uh, I, I'll, I'll give you the short form on the book. And why Stan Musial? Yeah, okay. Stan, uh, Stan Musial was a baseball player. He came along in 1941 with the St. Louis Cardinals and was a great, great player. He was as great as. Uh, Ted Williams and Joe DiMaggio, in his time, he's been more forgotten than these other two. And since, since the baseball gene pool expanded considerably <coughs> in 1947, uh, Musial has had less, um, you know, had less success. He never got back into a World Series. He knew it right away when he saw Jackie Robinson and some of the other Dodgers come along. He knew that the Cardinals would not be able to compete. Um, why a biography on him? because he's a, his subtitle is An American Life. It was a chance to write about a baseball player who's been forgotten. But the part that really appealed to me was where he came from, from Western Pennsylvania, came from a poor immigrant family, worked in steel mills, and ha had to work his way up from a, a poverty in his home and in the region. It's an American story about a, a 
Depression era kids who made it big in sports and what drove him out. I love writing about those themes. It wasn't so much about a star baseball player. That's what he became. But I love going back and finding about finding out about the before the word pollution or ecology was invented. The wonderful people from U.S. Steel were, were burning zinc. Uh, on, the, on the banks of the Monongahela River, and the zinc was going up into the air in pockets, and it would land in people's backyards and homes and lungs, and people didn't know it until 1948, when a thermal inversion came and killed about 25 people in the town, and uh, we can use the alone father who died a few months later, he was not in good health anyway. So all the things that we think about uh, American industry, they can build factories along riversides, and then when, it doesn't, uh, when, the, when the money dries up, it can leave the town worse than it began, uh, victims of, of uh, American industry, and even victims in the sense of dying because of the, the chemicals that uh, U.S. Steel was putting up into the environment. I thought that was a very American story. Uh, I, don't think you have to, I didn't have to think I was particularly radical to take that point of view as how I was raised. But I was very happy to be writing about him. And then to see that without going to college, he made himself into a businessman, had a very successful life, lived a very straight family life in a, in a profession that doesn't particularly encourage that, and was a successful businessman, and is one of the most popular people I've ever seen in any American city. He is the most popular person ever to go through the city of St. Louis, which at one point was a, a top 10 city. So to write about him in an American context, of how a city just absolutely adores him and feels in a kind of flyover way that people in St. Louis in the middle of the country feel. I know you all in Texas don't feel that way. You know, and flyover is not something that you worry about here because you know you're the center of the universe. But in St. Louis, it's St. Louis and in New York, we know we're the center of the universe. But, but in St. Louis, they feel like people are flying over at 30,000 feet looking down at the ark, and they get it ignored for a lot of reasons. So they have a bit of a complex there. It made me thrilled to go to St. Louis in May to sell my book, and I was on a talk, um, book author, radio show one morning, and little old ladies, that is to say, my age, were coming up with their little red cardinal shirts on thanking me with tears in their eyes for writing a book about their hero. And I'm live on the radio, and I've got tears in my eyes. I am touched at, at the love that they had. And that, that, you know, people in New York don't thank you for anything. It's the do, you know, that they expect whatever you do, you're expected to do it, and it's only right and so on. But for people in St. Louis, I was touched by it, that I had represented a man and, and an era that of course, as, a, as an older person, the Depression era, I came out of it. I was born in 1939 when he was playing professional ball in West Virginia. So I was honored to write the book. If any of you have a chance to see it, my, my kid brother, the, the educated one uh, who teaches at Colgate, he's used coal miner's daughter in some of his uh, American history classes of, about, uh, about Loretta Lynn because she comes from a, another poor part of the country. And uh, I'd be very proud if people saw this book in that way, not so much as a sports book, but a book about, as the subtitle says, an American life. Anyway, that's my pitch. I hope maybe some of you will get to see it. And, and, I, and I appreciate you, you being here. It's, it's a wonderful book, and it is a, a story of an American life. And it's, uh, I hadn't thought of it when I picked it up, um, but it was different than I expected. It, was, it truly was a, a story of a life as opposed to a story of a baseball player. And so any of you who have some time uh, to pick it up, it, it would be, it, it's a wonderful story and a wonderful book. And uh, a, a great man, he's 90. He's 90. 90 now. He's 90, he has Alzheimer's, um, is not particularly with it. He got a medal from the president in February. A friend of mine um, scored a, a guest pass for me so I was actually in the family guest area. The Museo family didn't cooperate with the book, and I wasn't with them. But I was there. I had a clear view of Museo space as uh, President Obama uh, put the medal on. And I didn't see him smile. But fortunately, the wonderful White House photographer for the New York Times uh, was coming out with He was taking some extra pictures for me. He was there, Doug. And he took pictures. And he caught the only smile I think that Museo could muster up. It was, it was kind of sad to see because he really wasn't very together. Um, we're, 
Are we almost done? Are we yeah. out, of, we out of time? Well, we're going to do some questions, but right. we, you know we don't have a... Well, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll close it this way, that the picture's on the back page because my wife saw that picture and said, you've got to, you've got to use Doug's picture on the back. And the editor of the book was able to reconnoit. I also got to shake hands with the president that day. Um, he was hanging around after the reception. And, um, of course, this, this fostered my life. You know, it was total Obama. But he was he was hanging around, hanging out with Joey Ma, who was playing, sitting on a cello, and uh, playing it with the Marine Orchestra. And the two of them obviously are friends. And this friend of mine who scored me the past was had a question to ask of the president, knew, knew him, and asked him a question. And the president stopped. And as he was, he said, "I got to go, guys. I got a meeting upstairs." And everybody said, "Well, go, hurry up, go get to your meeting." And as he's walking out, he sees about three of us standing there just alongside the wall. I'm not sticking out my hand. You know, he's going to a meeting. He's in his own house and he needs to go to a meeting. But the grace in him, he reached out and shook my hand. Now, I'm a seasoned reporter, and I've met a few sitting presidents. I've met uh, Bush, Bush, the, uh, Bush 41. Uh, I met him and a few other presidents I've met here and there. But the act of reaching out his hand in his home to shake hands with a few people just standing there on his way up towards the staircase. I was, and, and still am, months later, touched by it, uh, just the instinctive grace. And, uh, you know, the same goes, I haven't washed my hands since. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway. we, know, we know which way the Messy House is voting uh, in 2012. I, I, I didn't say that. We're neutral. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, questions? Um, and just yell them out, if you will. Someone wants to have a question. Al, do you want to start? Uh, and yeah. yell it out if you would. Uh, first, I want to say thanks for coming and speaking with that class. Uh, my question is, as a reporter, when you started off, obviously baseball was the dominant sport in the American landscape, you know, it dominated the news, media, and all that. Um, as a writer, and as it's shifted towards football in America, mm -hmm. Like, how do you weigh that? Um, as a writer, did you ever consider, you know, getting more into football, or you know, did you know it stick to your roots, or you know, what is that process? It's a great, it's a great question. Uh, you all heard it. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the answer is yes, and I also have uh, yearly evaluations from our our fellow boss uh, Neil saying, and you know, next year, uh, great reviews. But next year, you might consider doing a little bit more on the NFL. And, and he was right, and sometimes I didn't. But we also had, we're down to about one full-time columnist now. But at one point, we had five columnists. And Dave Anderson, who was my senior and a full surprise winning columnist, he loved the NFL. And he was, I wouldn't say proprietary, but he had the right to do what he wanted. And he was at the NFL. So I didn't feel the need to do a lot of it. I did some, and I liked being around it. I mean, I certainly. I'm as I love tweeting football by calling it, you know, American football and you know the real football and soccer and you know all that stuff. But I'm I'm no fool either, and I know that the NFL is a really big time. And when I go, I take it seriously. I like to listen. I've met the commissioner and I've interviewed players. I love being in locker rooms. So the answer is, you're right. I ought to. I probably haven't done as much as I should have. But I, I certainly acknowledge that it's there. College football the same way. Living in Florida for a while forced me to, to evaluate how important college football was and to take it really seriously more than I ever had before. I will say this: your market will also dictate your coverage, and in some extent, and not so much at the New York Times, but if you go someplace else, that could dictate. You know, football is is king here, but you could be someplace where it could be something else. Yeah, and, but it is it is in New York. I mean, we, we give a lot of coverage to it, and uh, certainly on Mondays. Time it, no, there's no <laughs> on, on Monday during the football season, I mean, Dave Anderson would have been at the home Jet or Giant game, or but I would go. I, I've been to games, you know, Jet games in Buffalo, and Giant games in Seattle, where, where one of my daughters lived, and you know, I'd find a way, uh, you know, to, to go out there. But I, I I did I did take it seriously, but not. But I never majored in it, and, and for good reasons, because we had, a, we had other good people. Bill Rosen, who played college football, loves to write about football, writes about it from a player's point of view as well as a writer, and uh, they didn't always need me on, on Saturdays and Sundays. But it's a very good question. Yo, yell it out. 
Uh, you were talking about the new era of reporters and how they kind of psychoanalyze players, but now uh, they can't really do that because more athletes, I guess, are trained to, to kind of hold back what you want them to say or how to get to them. Is there any way, have you found any way around that to kind of get the answers you're looking for? It's, it's not easy. It's a good question. It's not easy because <laughs> our time is limited and the players don't have to answer us. I mean, they're, they're more sophisticated than the players of another generation. And one of the problems is that Given, given a little bit of time, these are also players that are much more educated, uh, and they bring different gifts and different skills, they come from different cultures, but if they had the time, I mean, to go into a football locker room, um, I love talking to linemen, because not everybody's around them, and if you ask, uh, you know, you discover who the linemen are on the team, you know, Dave Deal with the Giants, or the... The Jets have a defensive lineman named Puha, I think there's a Samoan American guy who's just terrific. He's the most insightful guy, and nobody knows this except me and a few other people. And you go and talk to him, I'll tell you everything that happened from a defensive point of view. So there are players that will talk and will go off in, in directions, but you don't have the time. Uh, some players want to be, want, I mean, Keith Hernandez has been retired for 20 years from the Mets, but when Keith was playing, he would give out. The, 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 what he wanted to give out to the microphones and everybody, and then he would say, print media only. Now, Keith could control it, and he'd make sure everybody folded up their thing, and then he'd say, look, I love Gary Carter, but why wouldn't the kid hit the right field in a situation where you're trying to move? You know, he was analyzing the game for us. He knew we weren't going to burn him necessarily by saying Hernandez rips Carter, but he was talking about the game in ways that we learned from him, and it informed our conversation. And every reporter has, has sources, but he would see four or five of us that he knew. Those times are passing because it's now in the age of the blog and the age of everybody's got a microphone. Nobody ever talks off the record or talks for background in a locker room because somebody's going to come diving over the top of the microphone, and it's going to be out there on YouTube in about a heartbeat. So, so you can't. The players. On the one hand, they're very sophisticated in what they give out. On the other hand, they're, they're reticent to give out red meat to us. But if you stick with them, I mean, if, if you're in a jet clubhouse for an hour after a practice and you don't find I mean, 55 guys wandering in and out, if you don't find five of those who are really insightful, and it may not be the quarterback or the, you know, the, the, the safety that everybody wants to talk to, but if you don't find somebody that will really tell you what's going on in that locker room, you, you're not working at it. And, you know, we do. We find our guys. Doctor. George, uh, thank you very much for, for being here. It's, it's, it's a real treat. And uh, I've been reading your work for uh, decades, <coughs> way before uh, these devices and computers. And, and, uh, so it's, it's, it's really a treat to have you at my alma mater here. Uh, what and, 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 and the work you do, you really do infuse uh, so much culture and, and, and so much psychology and sociology, and you weave uh, uh, humanistic themes in, into your work. Uh, what's been one of the toughest stories that you've had to cover from uh, a humanistic, ethical uh, perspective? Well, anything, anything jump up? You know, I, I know things that I didn't do well, um, but I, I didn't necessarily know that at the time. I mean, steroids would be an example of it. And you look back and you say, why didn't I do better at that? But I, I think it's hard to cover people that you like who are not doing a good job. A um, guy I like a lot was the general manager of the Mets the last few years, Omar Minaya. Um, you know, and he's a great guy, yeah. you know. But it wasn't fun to watch the Mets get worse under his. And you know, and you have to say, while he was still general manager, I was writing, I was quoting Dante in a column about Omar's Mets. You know, you know the quote: "Abandon, abandon hope, all ye who enter here." Uh, I, I did that on opening day uh, a year ago. Omar was still a general manager, so this team is terrible, and it wasn't easy to do. And and athletes sort of say. I mean, I, I find that hard to do, but I'm not, I'm not hardcore sports columnist anyway. But, you know, I, I take it, 
I put it in perspective, but I don't enjoy, I don't enjoy seeing people fail. I didn't enjoy, um, you know, I didn't enjoy the Mets going downhill under Omar. Um, I don't like to see people fired. I don't like to see, uh, I saw a guy I've known since he was a player, Willie Randolph. I saw him sabotaged in the Met clubhouse by, by some people who were way up high in the Met ownership, I might say, uh, and people coming in the back door and getting in between them. And I didn't, I didn't enjoy that, seeing that, and wrote about it. But, you know, that's part, that's part of the game. But there's probably other things I could think about. I just, right now, it's, you know, it was hard to cover, you know, that I stayed with a long time. I can't, I can't think of one thing. I'm curious as to your writing process and the writing schedule. So when you're doing a column and a book, how do you juggle that? Do you touch each in the morning and the evening? Oh, my editors have often wondered that. <laughs> how, does, how does he do that? Uh, you know, if, if my editor would call me at 10 o'clock in the morning and say, what are you doing today? I mean, I'd be available, to, but I, I'm, I'm very disciplined. I work fast. I try not to do two things in the same day. I mean, for sure. I don't want to be writing it from 7 a.m. to 10 if I have to go to the ballpark at noon or something like that. I mean, I, I owe it to everybody to be sharp, but I, we get a lot of time off and there are weekends and, you know, sometimes I will, I will find a chunk of the day here or there, but it, it, it wasn't easy in you know, the last couple of years. I, I, I did it without, I've never taken a leave to do a book. So the answer is not easy, fortunately, because I'm, I'm pretty, pretty quick. And, get, and, and work easily both for the paper and for, for the book, but the research for this book was pretty hard, so it took a long time. As far as that goes, I'm a day person. I don't know, you probably all discovered by now, whether you're an early person or a late person, the world is divided. I happen to be, I'm, I'm an early person, my wife is a late person. So, you know, goodness knows, it's, it's an odd relationship. But I like to get up in the morning. I like to get up in the morning and work. And I'm happy if I'm at my, my laptop by 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, and I'm really into it. I'm going away while she's still having her second cup of coffee and you know, going at a different speed. So I like to write. If I, if, I'm a, if I have a day off or if I have a column to write, I don't like to work at night, which is tough to be in a business at night games. But I, I wanted to work. Of course, I work at night. But if, if I have a column to write, I will work on it in the evening at home. I'll sit down. I'll, I like to go to sleep early and relatively, and then I like to get up and work when my brain is clear. That's just what, what works for me. Uh, laptops have made more the world amazing. You know, I go back to paper. It was very hard to get to ball paper up and throw it out and start all over again. I mean, to be able to correct yourself, anybody that said it gets in, interrupts with the creative, that the computer interrupts the creative process is just bad because you could just do so much with this. That, 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 and you can you can turn things inside out. You can take a paragraph and say that doesn't belong in chapter 13. It belongs in chapter six or in a column. Uh, at the last minute, you can discover that you want like like your friend who who, who came up with his first sentence last. Uh, I will find things right on deadline and I will move them around and ship it off. But I'm blessed to be able to work very fast. It, it's something to work at. And for those of you who are in journalism. You know, writing for the paper, writing for class, it's a great skill to have. I've said this in the other two classes while I'm here. The journalistic skill of being able to take in information while it's a dying in the newspaper room, you know, not doing well and fewer jobs. For those of you who learn how to take in information and process it and give it back out, it will help you in a lot of fields. I have friends who went into public relations or, or business or whatever, and they were able to get the work done by Tuesday afternoon when the boss thought they were going to take all week to do something. Why? Because they're journalists. So it, is, it is a real skill to be able to, to understand reality and put it in some kind of form and to write it. If you have that skill, it will serve you well in so many fields. No business. Couple more. <laughs> Two more. Go ahead. Um, can you describe a typical day at work, um, including a sporting event? Yeah, go ahead. Let's How about that? Actually? There is there is no. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a superficial answer, but there are there are games, there are day games, there are night games. For night games, sometimes I have to prepare an early call, uh, or if I'm writing on a team, there are days when I hunker down at home on the phone and just lay out calls at 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock in the morning, calls all over. Sometimes I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and lay out calls to Europe or Asia. Um, it, 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 no two days are ever the same. I mean, I, and even, even when I think the day is going to be a certain way, I can get a call from the office at 11 o'clock or 4 o'clock that will turn me around totally. Uh, 
part of me whines about it and gropes and says, you know, why couldn't you got or whatever. Part of me loves it, and I love the high wire. The guy Neil that I mentioned before, our previous sports editor, he loved to call me at 6 o'clock in the evening and say, listen, big guy, I know you got your column done, but one of the Mets just went off on New York and how he hates playing here. Can you write a column in an hour? And, you know, I love that. I just love, because I'm fast, I love doing it. So it, it, it's, a, it's a blessing. It's also a curse because now you have your, 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 your sports editor calling you saying, big guy, can you do this? And it was, it was always fun to do that. That's, that's part of the job. It's, it's not falling off the high water. <coughs> I hope that answers it. But, but it's I never. Some in terms of going into the dugout, actually speaking to the players and that. Yeah, so, I mean, if, how does if, that work? If, if, if I'm at an, at, at an event, I will try and get, it's harder and harder to get to athletes before a game or round, but I will try. You know, you walk into a locker room, you see somebody you know. I've gotten a little bit friendly with a pitcher for the Mets. He's an older guy, R.A. Dickey. Terrific guy. He's writing his own book right now this year. And yeah, if I wander and see him, he's an upper grown up. If he sees me, he'll come over and say, hey, how's it going? What's going on? But those relationships, I mean, I'm older now. I don't have the relationships I did with athletes that I did you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So even that. But preparation is everything in journalism. And the earlier I get there, the more I hang out, even being in a press room, or if you're on the field and the owner comes by, or a guy like Old Roman Aya that you know will come and talk to you. Managers are less available. You don't schmooze with them the way you used to. But in, in all of journalism, preparation is everything <coughs> with the web. I download the night before. I prepare. If I know that I'm going to a football game and I haven't been to a, a Jets game in a couple of weeks, I'll download the last 20 stories that we've written on the Jets, and I will read them the night before. I don't like to write at night, but I like to inload at night and put stuff in my brain. I mean, it's almost not, it sounds clinical, but I know that if I just take stuff in and let it sit there, as my wife says, you know, you were thinking about your column while you were asleep last night, or why you were grinding your teeth, and this and that. I mean, I do. I, I work on my stuff around the clock. So I am pretty compulsive about taking in and preparing before I ever get near the ballpark, or before any, any sports event. Here's our last question, and everybody just sit tight uh, until we finish the question, and uh, then we'll be done. So, uh, this is when you first kind of got into the business. I was hoping you could comment on uh, the New York media's treatment of Roger Maris, uh, specifically when he's kind of going after uh, home records. I wrote a column on that a couple of weeks ago. If you want to look for it later, uh, it's online. I'm sure you can get access to NewYorkTimes.com. But I wrote a column. You actually opened a blog on that too, right? On, right. On Maris. Exactly. Yeah. A very successful blog because I realized the next day after I'd written a column saying, I, I called his son. His son was a terrific guy. And he cooperated with me. He was you know, pr promoting his father as, as well as he should. And he knew that I don't think Roger Maris belongs in the Hall of Fame. It's just my opinion as a, as a guy who covered Maris. I thought he had two of the best years I've ever seen, but he didn't have enough great years. His career statistics were not. Hitting 61 home runs, a uh, legitimate record in 162 games, I'm all for that. But I don't think he belonged. His son understood that. He's a big boy. And, and we had a nice conversation. I wrote a column saying, let me tell you, I saw Roger Maris in 60 and 61. He was a Hall of Fame caliber in those years. And then I wrote about Maris. He was a good guy. The stuff that's come in about him, it was the older reporter. Some of the older columnists with big egos got on him for, and, and Roger was blunt. I mean, he was, he was a, a hard-nosed guy. But with the, the working reporters, the younger reporters, the, the runts like I was, who were around, I thought he was a funny, cynical, smart-ass guy. I got a kick out of him. I found a story that I had done in 1961 for Newsday. I was there in a doubleheader. He had four home runs in a doubleheader. I'd forgotten it. And I found it in my clips. And I told the son about it. I sent him a copy of it. And so I wrote this whole column about Maris. The next day, after it was in the paper, I realized, and this is where the, the incipient, the inner blogger in me took over. I've been conditioned by this uh, Steve Radcliffe, this editor we have, to think about blogs. So I came up with a four-paragraph blog saying, while I personally don't think that Roger Maris should be in the Hall of Fame, I have great admiration. And then I linked, I guess you saw some of the links that I put in on my stories online. I said, but what do fans think? And then the blog just opens it up. We had like 125 within eight hours 
which is a lot, and they were all educated. I learned so the, the other side from it is when you get a good blog reaction, not just gossip, but serious fans. Fans know more than I do. Fans know more than I do about, about soccer, about football, about Roger Maris. They would drop it. I had a fan recently, the soccer guys, telling me that I was slightly wrong about the Ghana goal in the fifth minute that Ricardo Davis, Ricardo Clark gave up the ball, that I missed the point that Michael Bradley had led his defender into the way of Ricardo Clark walking up the ball. I hadn't seen that. Uh, I went back and looked, and it's ambiguous, but nevertheless, there are fans who know so much more than I do about individual plays. That's where we're into the, the age of democracy of the, of the web doing it. But to get back to Maris, if you find what I did, you'll also find the, the blog and the companies, and you'll have a, a very fun hour reading what some of the fans did, because they really had good opinions on it, back and forth. He does belong, he doesn't belong. They're pretty well evenly divided. And I respect both points of view, even though I'm on the, on the, the conservative side. Well, what a perfect uh, last question. George, I have a little something for you here tonight. Um, from 1961, the original tenant of the New York Yankees, oh. from 1961. Uh, which is a, a Yankee game. pennant in my household? Yeah, there you go. After I suffered as a child? Uh, you, you have to have this I, since you covered I, the team. I am, and, am uh, so, I am so honored. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, I have to tell you there, I knew those guys. <laughs> I, I have to tell you one thing, when we were corresponding about coming here uh, tonight, um, over the last several weeks, uh, George told me he had two choices He's on vacation this week. He could be in the south of France, or he could be in Austin with us, and look what he did. All right? Yeah. Yeah.